Hi, and welcome to Literary Hype. I am Stephanie, your Literary Hype woman, and today we're doing something a little bit different. We don't have an author conversation today. Instead, I have an actor conversation, a voice actor conversation. Um, I got to be part of the roundtables at San Diego Comic-Con for Audible's Moriarty and talked to three of the voice actors bringing this new take on Sherlock to life. So this is kind of a prequel. Um, so I'm going to let you listen in on the conversations with Dominic Monaghan, Lindsay Whistler, and the iconic Phil Lamar. So what was it like portraying yeah. Sherlock as the antagonist for this time? Um, Since he's usually, you know, the protagonist. What was that like? Well, the great thing about it was it's still the same character. It's not like, well, this is good Sherlock Holmes. This is evil Sherlock Holmes. It's the same character. He's still the most intelligent man in London. But now I have other things beneath what I'm doing. No spoilers. No. So, I mean, that's, that's what I, I love the most about it is everything that they've created in this new world is reflected in the original world. You know, it's like, oh, right, that's how, so Moriarty is the head of the crime syndicate, but now we know how and why. What did you do to make Sherlock your own? I mean, you've got to put your stamp on everything, you know, I, so many actors have played it. So what, what is your piece that you Well, for me, it was simply just taking the, I mean, because I've read all of the Arthur Conan Doyle books. And I basically just did the voice that I'd heard in my head reading those books, which wasn't Robert Downey Jr.'s or anybody's, you right, know. Right. Um, and just finding, you know, in this version, it's like, okay, is there anything we're coming to differently? So there were some little emotional shifts, but vocally, it was simply the same Sherlock Holmes that we've always known. Well, the biggest pressure was, you know, finding out, you know, the, working alongside or, well, recorded alongside Dominic and Billy. It's like, oh gosh, they've got real English accents. <laughs> make sure I'm on point. And, uh, and we definitely, you know, worked in like, okay, let's make sure, you know, we're keeping him in the the right, you know, level of class, and and thankfully the writing was there, you know, because that's that's where you can get into trouble is if someone is writing a character with a certain accent, but the writer doesn't do that right. And then all of a sudden it's like, I don't know if Sherlock Holmes would refer to something as the bomb. Guys, can we rewrite that? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, to me, I mean, especially, you know, any actor should be able to play any role that they can believably portray. But if this were on camera and you were setting it in, you know, 1800s London, it wouldn't be believable for the character to have my skin color. But the audio version is still believable. And so, I mean, for it, it to be an issue is silly. You know, it's like, well, has anyone who's ever played Sherlock Holmes been an actual detective? <laughs> no. It's like, well, I've got, then this is inauthentic. It's like, no, it's fiction. You know, I mean, I understand that there are certainly issues of representation that we're fighting against, you know, trying to diversify the perspectives of storytelling, but that shouldn't affect, you know, casting. The only thing that should affect casting is quality. I'm curious, I mean, as far as, like, when you guys are recording, like, how much do you get to interact and hear each other while you're recording? Like, is it kind of live in the moment? Are you listening to someone else hear, you know, somebody else's part and you're reacting to that? Like, what was your recording process like and how did that inform all of your performances together, like collaborating? 
Well, unfortunately, <laughs> mostly due to the pandemic, um, I recorded all of my stuff alone with no other actors. Um, although I'm sort of used to that because I've been doing a lot of animation and over the last few years, that has become the norm is each individual actor is recording their lines alone, which is a lot harder, you know, um, than when you're, you know, playing a group scene with the other actors, what they do can change the choices you make. But in these cases, well, I just have to imagine how Dominic might say that line as Moriarty and then me as Sherlock, I would respond in this way. And I mean, ultimately, the weight of that comes down to the editors and the producers. Like, did you direct them well enough that those lines fit together? And when you listen to the series, like, wow, it sounds like they recorded all this together. So that's good directing. So, <laughs> um, it wasn't challenging in the general sense because the script was so good, you know, I mean, obviously the, the challenge is just playing a character that is so iconic and not letting the iconism infect you. It's like, no, he's still a person who is having feelings and making choices for reason. So, you know, although that's, at this point in my career, that's not really, you know, a problem. Like every character has to be, you know, filled in and brought to life. You can't just sort of, you know, I mean, it's the, the audio version of stage, like, I am just gesturing to show you that I'm happy. You know, that's just bad acting. <laughs> So, you know, you're just, the, the, it's the challenge of any role. Make it real. But you have a difference in approach through animation versus podcast acting that uh, with animation, at least you see somebody's drawing of the character that you're doing. Do you approach that slightly different or any different levels? Um, don't uh, fall into the missed out fire uh, <laughs> trap. <laughs> In animation, you don't see the animation okay. before you do the voice. You may see a drawing, but then again, I've also seen images of Sherlock Holmes for decades. So in that sense, no, it was, a, it was the same. Um, and again, the visual informs it somewhat, but much less so than the story. You know, I mean, I know that Sherlock Holmes is not, you know, 90 feet tall. I'm not Sherlock Holmes. You know, I know that the voice is of a man of a certain height and weight in no, this era. And those, you know, it, it affect choices less than any picture of Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I'm not doing every line is, no, pretend he's got a pipe in his mouth. Well, I'm the proudest man in London. You know, nothing like that. Or he snorted cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> In certain scenes. Yes. No spoilers. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm a little curious um, because, I mean, so prolific in voice acting animation, you have this really you know, long career in it, um, and maybe some of the actors, you know, you know, they're screen actors for the most part. Did they come to you with any, like, did they ask you questions? Like, oh, is there any tips, tricks, things I need to know? Like, with you as like kind of the veteran voice actor on the cast, you know, you, you, you're like helping anybody out, like, oh, okay, here, pop your peas, like, here you go, like, <laughs> gotta put a pencil here. <laughs> no, actually, well, one, because we didn't record together, um, but two, also, because you've got actors of the level of Billy and Dominic and Lindsay, they don't need any help. You know, they are as good on a microphone as they are on a camera. You know, they just bring that level of talent to these characters. And, you know, it, it's not everybody who can do that. You know, just like there are people who are amazing live on stage that aren't that great on camera. 
but then there are people like Dominic who is amazing, you know, in a, in a screen 70 feet wide, you know, in a fantasy world. He's amazing on your TV set in a modern era, and he's amazing in your ears as Moriarty. Is there anything that you're hoping to see in the second season? Well, I'm just hoping to see a second season. Well, here, a second <laughs> Although the, seeing this has been interesting because it's like, oh wow, this is the first time I've had to put on a costume for a voiceover job. <laughs> I was going to ask you, is the hat going to become like a regular part of the wardrobe? Because I mean, you're rocking it pretty solid in some of those images I've seen. So. Well, I mean, technically that's all just for promotion, not actually for the performance of, you know, I'm not wearing the hat in the recording studio. I'm not into care. <laughs> Yeah, no method voice acting. Here. I think no seven percent solution next time. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's really good. So I was wondering, did you also sing? Was that you? That was me, yes. Oh, that was tremendous. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you so much. I um, I did a bunch of opera in high school, and I'm a musical theater nerd, like truly at heart. I have done a lot of that, and it was so like weirdly perfect when they were like oh and this character also does sing opera and I was like well like, hello um it's me um and that was just the greatest experience although I did I sung in my apartment because it was such a fast turnaround um with when they chose the song and transposing it and everything and I kind of took a lot of ownership over that just because I had the background in opera um and that was a little challenging because I have neighbors <laughs> trying to like time it the right way and make sure no one was truly bothered, but you do what you can. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it was. So it's a, interestingly, like there were a lot of aspects to the role, right? You have singer aspect, you have like British accent, which is like a huge undertaking, um, which I was nervous about, but luckily got a lot of training with theater. And also I was just telling them, I studied abroad in England. I still have some friends left over. Um, and so I would call them and be like, be as mean as possible, please. Like just destroy me if you must, if that's what it takes. Um, and so I made sure that that was good. So there were those aspects, those like superficial, like you need to have that, right? And then it's also just such an interesting, like deep character with a lot going on without spoiling anything. Um, and she has to be so intelligent and she has to be so like, um, have so much intention in everything she says and does. And I didn't want to be wrong about where I was in a script or like what my intention was at the moment because there was just so much, so much layering underneath. Did you lay out your scenes a little chronologically to keep, mm -hmm. keep track yeah. of where she was? Okay. <laughs> well, because so much of, because almost all of my scenes happen like as a flashback, right? Um, it is, I, I shouldn't know anything else that's happening technically in the show, right? I wouldn't have known any of it. So I tried to actually ignore a lot of what was going on with Moriarty and Sherlock later in the trial and just sort of stay in my small little arc of, you know, going to London on this beautiful vacation with my fiance. Oh my God, I love her. <laughs> um, so many things. I think she's a genius and I think she's a genius in her own right. You have Moriarty, you have Sherlock and they were talking about the smartest man in London, but Rose is obviously. If no contest, in my opinion, if we're talking about the smartest person in London. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I love any intelligent character. I think it is a blast to play. And especially when they're writing female characters, it's so nice when someone is truly a match and truly just independent on her own. So I love that about her. And then, of course, like the sentimentality of the fact that she's also a singer. She's also a musician in all of this. It felt like it was very me like it felt like i was reading a version of me i guess if i had been born in london in the 19th century um at, with secrets <laughs> born with secrets yeah <laughs> perhaps <laughs> yeah um it was actually it, it's a crazy story and no one has asked me yet so um i have to <laughs> next one um i have done a couple jobs for Audible already, had had worked on that. Um, and I 
I think on a whim, they just needed someone to read on the table read. I never, ever expected to be this character because they usually go with huge names for these things. You have Phil, you have Dom, they're incredible. Um, and I, they gave me the opportunity to read Rose on the table read, and I was like, okay, I've got to do really well at this. So I pulled out my British accent, and I like dusted it off, and I practiced, and I did the best I could, and it was an amazing table read. And then a couple of weeks later, they just reached out to me. They were like, um, director loved you, casting loved you, would you like to play this part? And it was, it was incredible. I was so happy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's been a really exciting ride. What was your relationship to like the Sherlock Holmes universe before this part, and then you have a different relationship with it now, having yeah. like, played in this universe? It's true. It's it's so cool to be part of any verse, right? <laughs> especially in nowadays. Um, I grew up, I think, in the era of the Sherlock Holmes remix. Like everything was like a play on Sherlock Holmes, and you know, subverting expectations. I was also a huge fan of Sherlock, the BBC series, big big fan to this day, and huge fan of murder mysteries in general. Actually, like I read so much Agatha Christie. I I like throw murder mystery parties with my friends because they're the best sort of entertainment. Um, but I uh, I. I went through an era when I was younger of like trying to read the classics and I tried to read a lot of Conan Doyle. I didn't read a lot. There's just so much. It's like 56 short stories, like four novels to get through. Um, so I made it through some of the short stories and I, sent, I felt like I had a really good background. But of course, when this part came along, there was just so much more to read, um, especially when you're joining any sort of canon. You like you, first of all, you want to like respect the source material and respect the fans who really care so much without, you know, you don't want to change something. You never know. Um, so I, I delved back into it and I, I got to learn a lot more. And our writer at Charlie too is a genius when it comes to this stuff. Like he knows everything. So I was able to ask questions and he was in our talks before I actually recorded, he had so much information. I think, yeah, I think there's always pressure. People care so much about Sherlock Holmes, and I totally understand because it's anything that's lasted this long is sort of feels immortal at this point. So you always want to do these people proud that like really, really care. You don't want to like step into their fandom or whatever and stomp all over it just because you you know I happen to get this attention and be the actor in this story like it's very exciting but it's also I think a huge responsibility and one that people shouldn't take lightly um, especially when there's so much that came before you so it was really about just like fitting in and and making sure I show respect to the fans and the source material <laughs> I love it. Um, no spoilers. Um, it seems that, you know, on the surface, she is, in a way, feels like this tool to open up Moriarty and show his emotional side, show what's interesting about him. But it's, it's so nice because you get a female character that isn't just a tool. She's actually doing a whole lot more. And, and in a murder mystery, she's, um, you know, she's everyone's got ulterior motives, everyone's got secrets. And so to play someone who might have, you know, an audience might have just thought is a trope and who becomes very real and very impressive is always, it's the greatest feeling. You mentioned your musical theater kid. So what's, oh, yeah. your, what's your dream role? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I have an answer. It's going to sound kind of funny, but that I think you guys appreciate a sense of humor. My dream role is Alpha Belinda which would be, I would like to play Alpha and Galinda someday, I think. Got to do both. There are only like two women who have done that. Why not me? <laughs> right? Like, I know it's, it's a bit lofty, but no, no, you've got to defy it. gravity, yeah. if you will. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned that you were a fan of the BBC Sherlock. Sure oh, yeah. Do you think that this adaptation, or kind of also new work at the same mm -hmm. time, like, is a kind of a perfect transition? Because, like, a lot of those fans who may have been still hungry for a little while. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there was a show last year on Netflix, The Irregular. This is really one of the only. Oh, and Enola Holmes. That is the other big one. Um, but, yeah, no, this one takes those characters and really brings them back in a, a really interesting way. I do love that it's a play on it still. Like, I love that you get 
your Sherlock, you get your Moriarty. But, you know, in the era of remixes, in the era of, re I, I don't know, rediscovering these characters um, within a new context, you get to learn, you know, that maybe Sherlock could be fallible. Because all of those qualities that Sherlock has, all the intelligence, all the deduction skills, they're so impressive. And the confidence is so impressive if you get it right, right? But if you don't get it right, which I think this kind of explores, the blind confidence and the like, I know everything and I am the end all be all of justice is a bit scary. <laughs> like, and it's a bit scary for the person who's wrongly accused too. So I think that was an interesting exploration and in a way it does tie into what we've been talking about in a cultural conversation now. I love, I love delving into any villain. I think it's always fun. Everyone thinks they're the hero in a story, I think. I, Dom said that too. I've always believed that. Like, you can't play a villain unless you believe you're the hero, you believe you're right. And I think in this case, it just switches up a little bit the perspective that we get, right? Because Sherlock seems to come across as a villain, but he believes he's the hero. And it's just a matter of who really is right factually. But everyone's got their convictions and everyone's got their motivations. And usually, even in life, I think everyone's motivated by, you know, some sort of love, some sort of caring, and they think they're doing the right thing. So makes a great villain then. <laughs> Let's go larger to the media. Even mm -hmm. before the pandemic, I think scripted podcasts, or as I like to call them, radio shows, uh, were on the rise. What, what do you think of, has, has caused that? Well, I think podcasting in general has just been the big boom of an industry, and it's really cool. I remember I wasn't really into podcasts until my senior year of college, I got really into a show called Invisibilia on NPR, and then, oh my gosh, did I just like, I binged that, and I've just been binging podcasts ever since, because there's something really nice about the fact that you're not glued to a, a screen. You can walk around, you can do things, and also, like, as a reader, I love the idea that you can imagine and create the only world in your head, you know? Like, Podcasts give you this opportunity to really be creative and be an active listener. And, you know, I don't know, you visualize whatever you want to visualize. You see a world, and it's kind of the fun of what reading is to me. Oh my God, I mean, endless book characters. Oh gosh, let's. Thing. I don't know. I, I will say Anne of Green Gables was always one that I just I gravitated towards and loved. And I love what they've done on Netflix with Anne with an E, so that one doesn't need to be readapted. Um, what am I reading lately? Like I was gonna say Percy Jackson, but they now have the Percy Jackson show. It's like all of the good ideas people are already doing. It's a good era for adaptations. Would you create your own literary detective? Like, write happily, your own drama. happily, I write a lot actually, um, and it's been really fun because I'm a huge mystery fan, and I'm actually working on a murder mystery web series um, with friends. Um, that's I won't say too much, but it's it's set with theater nerds. Perfect. Perfect. The drama. Exactly. It's already the most dramatic situation ever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. How much research when you got the script did you have to do to make the equations make sense? Oh man, well, I mean, that's that's a lot of acting, you know. I mean, I, I can't make sense of those equations and I, I can't figure out a lot of the things that he's speaking about is just stuff that I don't know. So then you just kind of lean into this thing as an actor where you try and make it work you know um some of the elements of of moriarty's personality i can understand but in terms of like the deep mathematical stuff you just have to try and fake it which is a lot about being an actor yeah there is a lot of faking as an actor you know? so can you talk about your history with moriarty as a character <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I, it's a weird thing with Sherlock Holmes in, in Britain. You just kind of know it. It's like Dickens' work. It's like The Artful Dodger or Oliver Twist or Hamlet or Macbeth. It's just part of the lexicon. You just know it, you know. So we all know Sherlock Holmes. We all know Watson. We all know Elementary. We all know, you know, 
uh, Baker Street and, and magnifying glasses and stuff like that. So I, I, I knew of those things. The Zemeckis film, Young Sherlock Holmes, was a big thing for me when I was a kid. The special effects were extraordinary when I was a kid. I mean, obviously, they're dated a little bit now, but they were incredible when I was a kid. Um, so that was a big, a big film for me. Um, you know, I read a lot of um, kind of children's version of Sherlock Holmes at school, kind of slightly diluted versions of, of Sir Arthur Conan um, Doyle's work. And, and then obviously with this, I mean, as an adult, I've read... Uh, quite a bit of Sherlock Holmes stuff. There's a there's a really fun Peter Cook and Dudley Moore film about Sherlock Holmes, which is interesting, right? Uh, those guys are fascinating. They've not aged very well, those two, and they'd probably be cancelled at this point. But um, but it's a fun film, and it's a funny film, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, I was aware of Sherlock Holmes much more than Moriarty, but if you know about Sherlock Holmes, you obviously know that Moriarty is his kind of arch villain. And the only person that really kind of contends with him in terms of like his intelligence and staying one step ahead of him and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I was, uh, I knew of the guy. For sure. <laughs> Speaking of which, Phil Lamar's amazing, obviously. What was it like working with him and getting to play those two roles against each other? Yeah, it's cool. You know, you need, you need a kind of similar energy to come up against yours if you if you've got kind of a nemesis you know so phil is you know phil's sherlock is is very similar to moriarty in the sense that they both think that they're right they both think they're doing the right thing they both think that they're justified in their in their actions and uh it was great to hear phil's kind of surety in his performance and um you know perfect english accent which was great and he's obviously a big sherlock holmes fan too so yeah super fun I think that's probably the more interesting thing for me with this project is just the point of view. That's all it is. It's just the point of view, right? I mean, you know, I'm sure Saruman sits around in his castle and thinks, man, that Gandalf is like a real big bastard. Like, why is he, <laughs> why is he treating me so cruelly? Why, why is he singling me out for special treatment? How come I'm the bad guy? And he's being mean to Wormtongue and Wormtongue is just trying to protect me. And, you know, like, it's just the point of view. That's all it is. So... I think with Moriarty, obviously, we're leaning a little bit more towards him being the good guy in this. But even if he weren't the good guy, if if you're reading the classic work of, of Arthur Conan Doyle, you can be like, okay, well, he's an intelligent guy and he's protecting his family and or his reputation or his money or he's trying to beat a detective at his own game. You, you can see how he can be a sympathetic character. And that's what I tried to do is with all the characters that I play, I, play, I played like legitimately bad people you know in my career but you can never be like okay he's a bad guy i play him like a bad guy you have to find reasons to like that person to relate to that person and uh that's what i did with uh with moriarty this year we have two projects I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure, really. I've always kind of been into that. I'm I'm interested in the minutia, you know. I have, like, several magnifying glasses on my dining room table. I very rarely eat at my dining room table. It's covered with, like, magnifying glasses. And if I find anything that I think is, you know, can look interesting under a microscope, you know, I'll have it in, like, a queue. So on the side of my dining room table, it's like, you know, a dead beetle and a dead spider and a dead bee and a dead a dead wasp and a, a branch and a piece of a leaf and this and that and a piece of mucus like what's that where's that from? So you know I like all that stuff. I've always been interested in the little the little things that kind of run the world, whether that's you know invertebrates or you know bacteria, which I'm fascinated in, or you know Billy and I have this have this podcast that we do every week called the Friendship Onion and. We have entomologists on and we have biologists on and we have quantum physicists on, which we're both interested in the small things in the world and how it all works. I don't necessarily know if Moonhaven or Moriarty helped me kind of continue to be curious about those things. I think maybe because I'm curious, I'm kind of drawn to those roles. Now that you've kind of had a chance to play in the world of Sherlock Holmes and Sherlock Holmes in the world a little bit, what do you think it is that is so... over and over and over again. 
Well, you know, the two kind of major people fighting in those worlds, Sherlock and, and Moriarty, are both very compelling characters because they have elements of their personality that maybe we hope to have in terms of their intelligence, their problem solving skills, their ability to think quickly and think outside the box. Uh, they're clearly, clearly very charismatic, but then also they're deeply flawed. You know, I mean, Sherlock is a drug addict. He's an alcoholic. He's not good with women. He's not successful with the opposite sex. He's a loner. Um, he's short on patience in the same way that Moriarty is. I mean, you know, he obviously has his own struggles. And I think we're, I think we're drawn to well-rounded characters, you know, like people that we can relate to because we all feel that way. You know, we all feel like, okay, there are, gr there are good things about my personality that I'm happy about. And then there are other kind of shadowy elements to my personality that maybe I'm not that happy about. But that's what makes us us. No one's ultimately good. No one's ultimately evil. So when you have like an incredible writer like Doyle who creates these characters that you can relate to because they're human, then you want to continue to like explore them and, and get into them and put them in different scenarios, which hopefully with something like this, we can continue to do. I think probably more than anything else, because it felt the most important, certainly in season one with, with Moriarty, and, and maybe I kind of release a little bit of tension on the reins in, in season two, is this point of view of, of feeling as if the the actions that are being forced towards him are unjustified, that he that he is right, and that for some reason everyone in society is against him and they think he's a criminal and he goes to prison and, and you know there's complications with his love life. And he's like, I didn't I didn't do anything wrong. You got the wrong man. I'm you know, you need to listen to me. I'm I'm right. This this kind of element of of feeling like things are unjustified because then that is a driving kind of motivation for him throughout season one. Maybe, we don't we don't know if there will be a season two or if indeed what will happen in season two, but maybe in season two, if at, if at that point maybe his name has been a little bit cleared, maybe he becomes much more of a simple kind of detective of like, okay, well, let's find out who else has been treated poorly like I have and maybe help them out. But so initially I had to have a very strong uh, feeling of like, I need to right the wrongs that have happened to me. Otherwise, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that gets him up in the morning, clearing his name, you know. That was the major thing for me. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>